almost snow-blind by the moon-bright sheen of the wastes he had traversed, Kamenwati squinted through the new brightness of the rising sun to see the ebony obelisks and pyramids misting in the chilly atmosphere. Ra had somehow crept around behind him in his journey through the underworld. He approached the marble sphinx, the gelid crystals of the crisp terrain tugging at his feet. Kamenwati had desecrated many funerary spaces in his banded days, and with only some difficulty made his way into the pyramid of Akinaferu. The space was dead, stale air and the expectancy of centuries snaked down each stolen breath. No living thing should have stalked these halls, save Akinaferu's ba, which was given free leave to fly here on exilian wings. The weary rebel meandered through the passageways as a thousand hieroglyphic eyes tracked out his shameful progress. They told the story of the first of times, with the crystal lotus rising from the turbulent sea of ice to warm the earth and give it life, when Kepha came into being and spoke the world into existence. The story stopped suddenly and Kamenwati realized that he had come to the point where the builders had relented in their labors. With the death of the pharaoh, their work was over. The pyramid could not be completed during her lifetime, for that would be asking Inpu to come too soon, and it could not be finished after the pharaoh had passed, for that would mean asking too late. In this way, every pyramid was a monument to internal incompleteness. Down a corridor, Kamenwati saw something shimmer, almost unimaginably. It looked to be a strand of some bright banner, but no wind could touch these inner sanctums, and the rebel was perplexed. He followed, and it seemed to him that all he could ever do was glimpse its tail. Near one of the star shafts, the banner relented, and he saw that he had been mistaken. It was Tamiri's Ba that traced out the labyrinthine pyramid waiting in an unearthly form for earthly rebirth. Scales glimmering in light imperceptible, her bow was flanked with exilian wings like oars, which gently undulated in mesmeric symbols of infinity. Her body swam the air in the vessel of the benthic Hakachi, elongated but graceful. Certainly, it was Tamari's Ba. It wore her face in aquatic abstraction, dark blue and scaled, with eyes which did not close nor shed a tear. She coiled her tail around herself when he saw her, revealing the constellations of her body, for down her back there hung like stars, but of hues and shades Kamenwati had never seen before, and some of which he only dreamed. The apparition did not speak, but shone so beautifully that when it curled away, dancing strangely with its tail, he could do naught but follow it. It was insubstantial that the spirit was leading him towards the funeral chamber of his dead mistress and love. When there the Ba swam lazily at the head of the crypt, Tamiri's painted effigy smiled serenely up at him. He placed a hand upon the wood in hesitation. Would he risk violating the eternity of his beloved for the ephemeral enjoyment of a parting sight? He looked the question up to Tamari's ba, but the scaled countenance offered no insights. He re removed the lid to look upon her. Like stirring a child from its slumber, the effect was immediate but torpid. The dead queen was waking. Kamenwati whispered, bending over their sarcophagus, My queen, my queen, I am in pain and much confused for what has happened here. O oh, Rasui, the mummy reached up to touch his troubled cheek, her hand smelling of perfume, wine, and resin. I wanted you to be the one who kissed my stomach with the tongue of obsidian, and give to me this boon of life. I was no blasphemer. You were my ma'at. Yet you did, she looked down, her ba's eyes following. You were charged with a sacred blasphemy of a kind only possible for the hands of a rebel, and you followed me to the underworld while yet above the earth. I live again, Rasui, and so shall you, Kamenwati, the fallen is redeemed. He would have questioned further, but she hushed him with a gentle gesture, and he spoke no more. She reached up her cloth-bound hand for him to receive it. He did, 
and helped her carefully from the coffin's depths. When she stood again, her bar returned unto her. Come and Wati, the fallen is redeemed, began to remove her wrappings, slowly, as jeweled starfish and anks fell noisily to the floor. The sticky paints and resins of the cloth crinkled as her flesh was revealed, tanned and dry, but warm and soft and young. How many times, he mouthed the words, as long as Ma'at maintain us. The queen, naked but unashamed, took the weary rebel's hand and led him through the star-charted ways of her pyramid. They left one of Akinaferu's many tomes and stood to greet the season of the light. <laughs>